This is QTV News. I am Marietu Sidibe and thanks for joining us. Coming up, General Alaji Martin told the TRRC, I tortured suspects but denies some allegations. U.S. dollars 92.5 million for 2022 OIC summit. Major infrastructural projects planned. Government students lag behind Ghana, Nigeria in WIAC. Students do more theory and less practical according to a study. For more on this and other stories, stay tuned. General al Haji Martin, a much-mentioned individual, testified on Thursday at the ongoing TRRC public hearings. During his testimony, he admitted coordinating and participating in the torture of former council members Sana Sabali and Sadibu Haidara. He also admitted taking part in the interrogation of military and civilian detainees arrested in 2006 for allegedly taking part in a coup plot led by former Army Chief of Defense Staff Cornel Ndur Cham. QTV's Ansumana Esonyasi is covering the TRRC proceedings and he now reports. General Alaji Martin of the Gambia Armed Forces on Thursday admitted allegations of torture made against him by several TRRC witnesses. He made the admission while testifying at the ongoing TRRC public proceedings. His testimony was in relation to the arrest and torture of former council members Sanna Sabali and Saribu Haidara, as well as military and civilian detainees arrested in the aftermath of the March 2006 foil coup. In his testimony, he alleged he was ordered by former President Jame to supervise and interrogate former AFBRC Vice Chairman and Interior Minister Sanna Sabali and Saribu Haidara. However, Contradicting allegations made against him by several TRC witnesses, he denied interrogating or participating in the torture of Saribu Haidara. In fact, he told the commission he only supervised Sabali's interrogation twice. Asked about allegations made against Saribu Haidara and Sana Sabali that they had planned to overthrow then Chairman Jame, the witness alleged that those claims were false. When you went there, what did you do with Sana? Yes, we quick shot him. And what else? Yes, only quick shot in. Nothing was he else. tortured? He was beaten. Was he tortured? He was beaten. He was beaten, board struck, slapped. All those things have been done to him. And that because amount, he refused to talk. And that amounts to torture, isn't it? Well, he was beaten mercilessly. <laughs> yes, I can say that. Yes, by our hands, beaten. Okay. You yes. are satisfied to call it beating. Yes. But you would not call it torture. No, no. On his alleged participation in the torture of military officers and civilians arrested in the aftermath of the abortive March 2006 coup, the witness denied those allegations. He did, though, admit to taking part in their interrogations at the NIA headquarters. However, he was involved in a heated exchange with counsel in which he denied he was present when civilian detainees were interrogated. At that juncture, statements recorded by the said detainees were read out to him. He also admitted to the commission that confessions were obtained by falsely acquired admissions of guilt following torture of the suspects. You agreed that you tortured Sana Sabali? Yes. You agreed that you participated or presided over the torture of Sadi Wahida? You agreed that you participated in and presided over the torture of uh, RSM Sanyang? Yes, Sanyang, yes. But for Sabali on two occasions, that I can press on that. Only two occasions, not the other. Yes. You agreed participating in the kangaroo panel that was aimed at Obtaining confessions from suspects by force, yes. correct? Yes, correct. You participated in a panel that tortured suspects and extracted conf uh, confessions from them, correct? Correct. 
you participated in the falsification of evidence that incriminated suspects who were brought before the panel. Correct. Those are the violations which you accepted. Correct. The witness, a still serving officer, is expected to reappear before the commission to testify on other issues. And Swana is on Yasi for KTV News. The government of the Gambia and the Saudi Fund for Development have signed a $92.5 million funding agreement linked to preparations for the 2022 OIC summit to be hosted in the Gambia. Alusise witnessed the signing ceremony at the State House in Banjul and he now reports. The funds comprising grants and loans will be used to finance major projects for the summit. The projects include the construction of the 50-kilometer road network within the OIC concentrated area and the enhancement of the transmission and distribution network for the electricity grid. In addition, funds will be used to support the upgrade of water production, treatment and distribution, and as well the construction of a new VVIP lounge at the Banjul International Airport. Gambia's Finance Minister Mabou Njai and Dr. Khalid S. al Kudairi, Vice Chairman of the Saudi Fund for Development, signed the agreement on behalf of both parties. The ceremony was presided over by President Barrow. The Gambia's Vice President, who is also the Gambia OIC Board Chairperson, Dr. Aysel Touré, described this as a milestone in the Gambia's development strides, as it will usher in better public infrastructure. The government of the Gambia wishes to extend its heartfelt appreciation to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for the benevolent gesture from the Saudi Fund for Development. I must at this point register the government's profound thanks and appreciation for the generous support of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia under the able leadership of His Highness King Salman bin Faisal, the King of Saudi Arabia and custodian of the two holy mosques of Mecca and Medina for providing the initial core grant of $3 million US dollars to run the OIC Gambia Secretariat as well as these funds in support of our overall plan. Dr. Khalid S. al Kudairi, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of the Saudi Fund for Development, said this initiative was a demonstration of the partnership between Banjul and Jeddah. He went on to say the Saudi Fund for Development was keen to continue its cooperation with the Gambia. The uh, aim of this important project is to improve the living standards of uh, population in the project areas and supporting the development of countries' uh, economy. Um, with the financing of these projects, uh, the, uh, I, I guess uh, we are continuing the, the ongoing cooperation between the, uh, the government of the Gambia and the Saudi Fund for Development. Uh, I think the total support of the Saudi fund uh, to the Gambia will reach around 200 million, uh, of which uh, 43 million uh, are grants. The Saudi fund's contribution to the Republic of the Gambia in terms of socio-economic development has impacted citizens at the lowest level of our society in that they have contributed, included in this project, almost $200 million. They have contributed to the roads, education, energy, and economic development sectors in this country. The Gambia could not host this year's summit settled for November 2019, as various facilities for the conference were unlikely to be ready. The venue was resettled for Saudi Arabia. Leaders at the summit agreed and recommended for the Gambia to host the 2022 summit. The OIC is the second largest intergovernmental organization after the United Nations. It has a membership of 57 states across four continents. Reporting for QTV News, I am Aliou Sise. Government permanent secretaries are participating in a three-day retreat at Tendaba to measure progress in implementing their priorities as set out last January. This second quarterly meeting in 2019 is described as an opportunity for the senior civil servants to jointly draw lessons and identify challenges and devise solutions to successfully implement the National Development Plan. Momodu Lamin Choi reports. It is called a permanent secretaries and planners retreat. 
these senior civil servants are going through a process of what is believed to be self-assessment on implementation of their duties. At the retreat, some policymakers raise concerns about the need to deliver on their mandate, which is to meaningfully change the lives of taxpayers. The exercise is not the first of its kind, but participants vowed it will not be business as usual. You have to look at that critically. We are spending government funding, taxpayers' money. You spend 275000 on average on a secretary. You want to send him to Ghana to train. And when she comes, what has it improved in your work environment? We have to critically think about that. And I think all of us should be very sincere to ourselves and honest. What you are doing, you think that 275,000, somebody sitting in Kian Neymar, you think you are not unfair to that person. The president's special advisor, Mohamed Fati, urged those present not to make excuses about obstacles hampering them in doing their jobs. He advised permanent secretaries to identify laws preventing smooth implementation of policies and to send them to cabinet for reforms. He also outlined what the president aims to achieve through the delivery unit, namely an improvement in the visibility of outcomes on national priorities, the unblocking of obstacles, and to ensure speed in putting policies into effect. Where we will not cooperate is when there is deliberate reluctance to proceed further. Then in that situation, you will have to make a choice. Either you become a significant player in the success mechanism, or you up again, or you up for a new future. We spoke to two analysts holding opposing views on the usefulness of such retreats. There's a sense of urgency. People are dying of curable diseases in this country. There's a lot of things happen. People are dying in labor, in maternity wards across this country. You know, if you want to show people you really care about development, get to work. There's always meetings. The president just had a rally. How many money, how much money did he spend there? Actually, they couldn't have, have organized such a meeting just to go and discuss over the table without having reflect, reflect, reflect um, without having to reflect on assignment that they actually assign themselves to. So basically it's about more like accountability. You know, if a department has a set of goals that you want to achieve, you know, how do they hold themselves accountable? Now instead of the citizenry holding them accountable, they're holding themselves accountable. Mumu Lamin Choi for QTV News. A study to understand the scope and structure of subjects offered in the West African Senior Secondary School Certificate Examinations has concluded. The study by Dr. Brahma L.J. Jame, Director of the Curriculum Research, Evaluation and Development Directorate, reveals that Gambian students, as exam candidates, are provided with narrow opportunities to benefit from a variety of practical based assessments in the West African Senior Secondary School Certificate. Babu Karsi has the rest of the story. The study found that out of 97 subjects, only 39 are available to the students' candidates in the Gambia. They also uncovered that candidates in Ghana and Nigeria have a wider range of subjects in the fields of education than those in the Gambia, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. The study further revealed that the subjects available in the Gambia are more academically oriented, while those available to candidates in Ghana and Nigeria are broader in scope with a variety of technical and vocational components. Dr. Brahma L.J. Jame, who personally conducted the research, tells us some of the things he found out. Our analysis of subjects available to candidates in the Gambia source one the subjects that are available to gambian candidates are academic oriented subjects they are very academic so those who are good at skills are pushed out they are not they are not catered for in the same way as they are catered for in nigeria and other people two do we have limited options for students to identify their interests and talents. Everybody who does education, we know that the subjects, the lessons, curriculum, should take into account the interests and aspiration of students. Because even your lesson, 
it will not be meaningful if, if it doesn't correspond with the interests of the students. So the interest, the wide range of you know, interests of our candidates are not being catered for at the level of us. But one might ask, why are the Ghanaians and Nigerian students performing better than their Gambian counterparts? By this study, every other thing remains the same, like the student factor, the parental factor, background, you know, schools, and so on. I'm saying the scope and structure of subjects explain available to other countries explain why they outperform Gambian candidates. Now this is because range of options for students' interests and talents are available in other countries. They have other range of options. In Ghana, for example, a student can choose, I am a technical, I want to, uh, I want to specialize on I mean, visual arts. Or I want to specialize so he can do basketry. He can do leather work, you know. He can do crafts, other crafts, uh, fisheries, and so on. Okay. Now, what also the like? If you look at Ghana, they have program approach. They have grouped their subjects in a way that after those four, four subjects, English, maths, integrated studies, and uh, the fourth one, um, social studies. The students can also only, uh, either go to agriculture, where you will have anim um, uh, horticulture, fisheries, forestry, forestry anim animal husbandry, whatever. All right? To make up your aid. Because if you have a core, then you have these four, you have eight subjects, isn't it? So the, these subjects are very related. In the Gambia, we don't have that opportunity. They are all in one. Key amongst the recommendations is to increase opportunities for the Gambia's candidates, which requires more resource allocation to curriculum development to expand the scope and nature of subject specialization in the Gambia. It is hoped that the authorities will take on board the findings of this study to engage WAIEC to make more subjects available to candidates in the Gambia. It is also hoped and expected that the senior secondary school authorities will use the findings to guide them in offering a broader range of subjects in the schools and to guide students in the selection of subjects. Babu Karsi, QTV News. Police and staff of Women's Bureau were trained on gender management information systems on Thursday. The objective of the training is to build the capacities of end users in the effective and efficient utilization of the management systems. The training was funded by the UNDP. Ajibinto Drame reports. The training focuses on gender-based violence in the Gambia. Gender-based violence is violence against an individual that can either cause physical, sexual or psychological harm or suffering including threats such as coercion or arbitrary denial of liberty. It is hoped that the database system will help filter information in the Women's Bureau and other institutions. Furthermore, it will also help the trainees in managing the database system about to be launched to properly administer the system in their various fields of work. The UNDP has been active in organizing training in managing and capturing data on gender-based violence especially in the Gambia. Deputy Resident UNDP Representative Nessie Golake Gold says the program is to support and stop the high level of GB violence in the Gambia. She says this should be addressed. Nessie Golake challenged the participants to implement the knowledge gained on the course and to make use of the data operationally. Yeah, the statistics we received showed that over a course of the last two to three years, there had been an uptick in the number of GBV cases um, reported. However, there had not been a similar rise in the number of those cases that had been taken up to a conclusion within the judicial system. So the system, even though it's an important milestone, is not sufficient 
We need to use the data. It needs to have real and relevant data for it to continue to be useful, not only to policy makers in the Gambia, but I think also regionally and internationally, who, come, who support regional, global, and even national policies and trend, and also to show the significance of the Sustainable Development Goals and the AU20 agenda within which all of our actions are embedded. In times of crisis, women and children are mostly vulnerable. The Gambia has no reliable data on the prevalence of gender-based violence on women and children. A participant, Superintendent Jaina Babahum, Officer Commanding the Serekunda Division Gender and Child Protection Unit, says the data will improve their work and make it easier. She explained how her institution helps vulnerable women and children and also spoke of ways to put into practice the knowledge gained on the training. Never mind is a family member, but is a perpetrator. So Gambians should come out and report cases. The knowledge will be implemented because we have the main data in our office. So all these officers are within the Gambia. And I think the main data is in Serekunda, in Basse, etc. So they will make good use of this training, really. Our institution support through social welfare because we don't have the means. We depend on stakeholders and social welfare. So most of the cases, when we re receive cases, we refer them to social welfare by escorting them to social welfare and see the help we can give. Jaina Babahum says the culture of silence around reporting cases of gender-based violence needs to be broken. Cases need not to be hidden in order to help the victims. She also adds that creating more awareness through community outreach and other methods are essential. Ajibin Sudrame, QTV News. On Thursday, the Gambia commemorated World Environment Day with the theme Air Pollution, organized by the National Environment Agency. The event started with a march past and ended with an open day at the NEA office in Kanifeng. Maria Tussar reports. World Environment Day is commemorated every year June 5th. However, due to falling within Ramadan, the National Environment Agency, NEA, settled on this later date. World Environment Day is one of the main vehicles through which the United Nations Environment Program, UNEP, seeks to make the biggest global call and mobilization for action to stimulate world awareness about the environment and so enhance political attention and action. This year's commemoration in the Gambia commenced with a march pass led by the police ban, with students from the NEA partner schools in the Greater Banjul area and officials from the National Environment Agency. The process started from the Youth Monument in Westfield to the NEA office in Carnifing. The open day was graced by students and dignitaries from government institutions. The Minister of Environment, Climate Change and Natural Resources, Lamin Diba, gave the keynote address and emphasized that the concerns about the environment is not an individual responsibility but a collective and collaborative one. I want to emphasize that the business of environment is beyond an institution, is beyond an individual. It is a collective responsibility to respond to the challenges that we, mankind, put in the environment. So most of the problems that we are encountering, particularly the theme of this year's celebration, is anthropogenic, that is man-made. Therefore, it requires all of us and it behoves on all of us as a responsible citizens of the globe, not only the Gambia, but to take a global action, regional and national actions that will support the efforts of the international community within the framework of the international instruments that we all signed up to. Executive Director of the NEA, Momodu J. Suare, in his speech mentioned that he believes the increasing level of outdoor pollution is as a result of transportation system in the Gambia. The increasing levels of outdoor pollution, especially in urban areas such as Banjul, Kanifing, Serekunda, Brikama, requires 
transport solution that include reducing means of travel by investing in sustainable mass transport system. Honorable Minister, being here, we are challenging you to tell colleagues in cabinet that this is what we need to do. We think transport system is the major cause of our air pollution and we need to do something with it. World Environment Day was hosted by China with the team Air Pollution. We can't stop breathing, but we can do something about the quality of air we breathe. Approximately 7 million people worldwide died prematurely each year from air pollution, with about 4 million of these deaths occurring in the Asia-Pacific region. Reporting for QTV News, I am Maria Tussar. Before we end this bulletin of the news, let's take a quick look at our main stories. General al Haji Martin, a much-mentioned individual, testified on Thursday at the ongoing TRRC public hearings. During his testimony, he admitted coordinating and participating in the torture of former council members Sana Sabali and Sadi Haidara. The government of the Gambia and the Saudi Fund for Development have signed a $92.5 million funding agreement linked to preparations for the 2022 OIC summit to be hosted in the Gambia. A study to understand the scope and structure of subjects offered in the West African Senior Secondary School Certificate Examinations has concluded. The study by Dr. Burama L.J. Jame, Director of the Curriculum Research, Evaluation and Development Directorate, reveals that Gambian students, as exam candidates, are provided with the narrow opportunities to benefit from a variety of practical-based assessments in the West African Senior Secondary School Certificate. That's all we have for you in this edition of the news. Join us tomorrow for more news. Thank you for watching.